My goodness gracious, I can see some beautiful bottles there. They all have question marks. I guess that means we're going to have to do some guessing today. Um, pretty cool. I hope that nobody's peaked. I hope that everybody has their, their instructions and have read every page of the instructions because um, it tells you don't peek. Make sure that you've got your friends and everybody else there and you've got your glasses. Um, I chose to pre-pour my glasses so that they're ready to go. My recommendation so you don't have to get up and down. You might want to pour a couple ounces into each of your glasses. I recommend putting the number one wine in the number one glass and I would also recommend using your little chart that you have to be able to put where the glasses go. That way we're talking about the same wines and the same glasses. Um, okay. Uh, hey, there's some amazing folks that are actually out there. Uh, Nick Salamini out in Naples, Florida with his mom, Donna. That's pretty cool, Donna. You got your son to drink some wine with you and learn something. That's pretty terrific. Oh my God, Ethan, what are you doing? Ethan and Catherine from uh, Colorado, great friends of ours from Triple Creek. Ethan, you got to tell everybody about those boots that you're uh, wearing these days because I'm sure you're wearing out. You've probably worn those out, but uh, uh, Craig's delighted to have you wearing those boots. Um, Jonathan Morris and all the triple team seat team are all there. This is kind of fun. Here's a guy who was planning on coming to the Napa Valley. And because of this amazing COVID thing, they had to cancel their trip. And they said, if we're not going to go, we're going to be able to do something at home. And they sent this to all their friends. And so they've got 10 or 12 friends that they've sent this package to. And um, so welcome, you guys. I see that you're out there. Uh, uh, Charles Carpenter from North Carolina and Kelly uh, in New Jersey. That's pretty cool. You're doing this separately, but doing it together. Pretty nice of... Uh, the family to be able to send these to each other and do it from different spots. Rusty and Jackie O'Kane, also separate but tasting together, Dallas, North Carolina. You know, Rye, this is going to be fun. we got people all over the country tuning into this little project that we're doing. Um, I think it was a great idea. Um, just letting you know a little bit of how this works. Um, the idea was conceived by some of our friends, and uh, we decided to take them up on it. They said, what are we going to do? We're home this much time with all of our kids. We said, well, you're drinking. Might as well have some education when you're drinking. So that's how it started out to be. And uh, make it real easy for you. Every one of these bags were done by Erica and Blasley with the numbers on them and um, sent to you with loving hands at home. And uh, hopefully now you have all the wines in front of you. We're seeing some more people drift in as we're working on this right now. Um, so. First of all, I forgot to do one important thing. I guess I better introduce myself. I'm Cyril Chapelet from Chapelet Vineyard. Uh, we are here in my cellar because uh, we can't be there in your living room because we might be closer than six feet apart. So, um, hi, Ryan. Good to see you over there. I can see you. Hi, right. Cyril. Um, and Ryan is in the winery and he's got right in the row of the barrels there. and. Uh, those looks like some beautiful French oak barrels or something right behind you. And uh, I think we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment or two. Um, remember, don't peek. Don't open up these bags. These bags are done lovingly to protect them from your visualness. And this is meant to be a guessing program. It's also meant to be that we're going to have a poll. We're going to be able to test your knowledge. And you're going to be able to see immediately how well you've done. What we're also going to do is try to help you through the process and give you some markers, give you some ideas of what would a Merlot taste like? What would a Cabernet taste like? And some of the uh, portions of this. Um, this is meant to be a tasting. Um, I use a, a cowboy mug here. I don't know if you can see that, but I use a cowboy mug um, as a spit cup. So, uh, and Rye has a nice stainless steel one. He's a little more upscale than I am. Um, but Stainless I'm going to mug here. Uh, anything will work. A solo cup. Anything that you have will be perfect. Um, you've got between two and four ounces in your glass. Um, my hope is you have glasses that are fairly similar. Fairly similar is great because that way the smell, the scents, the aromas, everything will be uh, similar to 
uh, what they would be. And if you put use different glasses, they might have more sensations that might be different to you. So um, a little brief history. Chapelet is my dad was my dad's dream. This was 1967 when my father purchased the vineyards here on Pritchard Hill. Um, he was the first vintner to be up here and the first person to make wine up on Pritchard Hill. And that's 50 some odd years ago. Uh, my math isn't very good, but I know it's over 50 years, so we'll get there. Um, and it was really his dream. There's six brothers and sisters, three boys and three girls, my mother and my aunt. They're my board of directors. They're actually who I work for. And as weird as this is, Rye kind of works for me, but he also works with some of his team. He'll talk maybe a little bit about Philip and the rest of his team, um, because as we talk about, this is not a solo sport. This is a team sport. It takes a lot of people to make great wine, and it takes a whole cast of characters in the vineyard to do it. So there's an awful lot of things that all become part of this. It's been my passion for years and years to be involved with the winery. We're in a very different time, but we're learning an awful lot of how to speak to people, what things that we can do to uh, be in front of you without being in front of you. So um, this virtual tasting uh, is a lot of fun. The other part of this is if you have questions, please set them, send them to us. We will try to answer any questions you have. Probably Ryan and I can stop and start any place. If he sees a question he wants to answer, if I start getting them, we'll work it back and forth. It's not like we have a rote program here. We're pretty loose and easy about it, but it's really meant to be fun. The bottom line, this has to be fun. And my recommendation is drinking with other people is more fun than drinking by yourself. So hopefully you've got some other people, and if you don't, you can look on the screen because we're here for, for you. So I'd like to have uh, Rai say a little bit about, you know, what inspires you, Rai? What is it that makes you get up every morning and make these incredibly beautiful wines. And, um, you know, what motivates you on a daily basis? Uh, I know one thing does, you're a remarkable, incredible family, all your gardens and all the rest. And uh, I know that that's part of a motivating factor for your gardens and all the rest. And I'd love to have you speak a little bit about all of it. Talk to about a little bit about who you are, Ryan. So I'm Ryan Richards. I'm associate winemaker at Chapelet. I've been, part of the Chapelet winemaking team for 13 years, uh, be 14 this coming December. And I think, you know, other than my family, you know, they certainly motivate me, but really the family of Chapelet motivates me for wine. Uh, we all take care of each other through this process and we're all really dedicated to making the very best wines that we can possibly make. And that starts in the vineyard with Dave Peary, our vineyard manager, and Enrique, our vineyard foreman, who basically has been part of the brand since the very beginning. Uh, Dave's been managing the vineyards, I believe, since 1984. And then my boss, Philip Titus, uh, has guided winemaking since uh, 1990. And so there's a lot of lineage at Chapelet, and being able to be a part of that and learn from it and try to make our wines as good as they can possibly be on a daily basis is a real pleasure. Um, not only that, but Cyril and his whole family uh, really support us in our endeavors and they're constantly trying to make, you know, work fun, enjoyable, and just a really pleasurable experience. So that's what this is really meant to be. For all of you, this is supposed to be fun and enjoyable as possible. Uh, for people like Cyril, Philip and I, wine making or wine tasting is kind of like an indoor sport, but for you, this is supposed to be really enjoyable. So hopefully we can guide you through this somewhat blind tasting. Hopefully you haven't cheated. Um, if so, that's fine, but we'll help you cheat a little bit. We'll guide you through what these wines are like uh, and we'll kind of open it up from there for some questions later on. Um, as a personal note, uh, Chapelet is my second family. I met my wife there in 2008. She's also a winemaker, so wine comes from work to home, from home to work constantly for me. So this is a pleasure to be with you in your living rooms and tasting wine with you. So one of the things I think is really important is when we do these formal tastings at the winery, one of the things that we do is typically have a blank piece of paper with, in your case, one, two, three, four down the side so that you can 
be able to write a little bit about what your impressions are of the sense, of the smells, of the taste. Our palates are really driven by our sense of smell. 85 to 90% of what we smell is what we taste. So that's an important part of our whole structure. Now, it gets really complicated here and it can get really challenging. To give you an idea, flavors that go into wine can be, as far as the master sommeliers tell us, can be over 800 different taste sensations that are able to be identified specifically. When we think about that, that's immense. The one thing that Ryan and I will tell you all day long, we can't tell you exactly what you're tasting. Your taste beds are unique to you. We might say something is a little bit raspberry, and you may say, no, you know, I get a little cherry flavor or something, you know? So, so everybody's gonna be a little bit different as to what they taste. Ryan, you wanna talk to them a little bit about the flavor and the structure of, or, and maybe also how we physically smell and, and taste them. Yeah, so first we're gonna go through the noses uh, one by one. So, uh, you know, start with wine one, proceed to wine four, and really, you know, whip that glass, get it, get it going so that nose and bouquet can really come out to your nose. And it is important what Cyril just said is that in winemaking, your nose is your strongest tool. We can do the very best through modern technology and wine and having the perfect vineyards and everything else. But if you don't have a nose, then you got to get using your nose. So get into that glass, really let that bouquet hit you. You know, maybe you're getting some oak spice, some berry, you know, and we'll go into the specifics of what we think, you know, each of these wines could possibly be. I have a great slide to kind of guide you through the tasting uh, as we start up. In fact, I could probably pull that up and screen share it with you now. So this is what it would be. Cyril, can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. We'll get there. Well, while he's pulling that up, Colin McAlpin, Damn nice to have you here. This is great. Tim Hurley, I see you there. Doug, hey, great to have you from New York. And Jamie, uh, you got four of us from Tampa. That's pretty cool. Oh, look what's in front of us. This is what we call a flavor and aroma wheel. If you look at this from left to right, this pie chart is very, very cool because it gives you some of the flavors that tie into the texture, some of the smells that go into the flavors that your palate senses. So, um, Ryan, you want to kind of walk through that a little bit um, and just kind of give them an, an idea of uh, how this really works? Yeah, you know, I think the important thing to know about the aroma wheel is this is how complicated it can get. You know, are we talking about a, a, an oak flavor, a berry flavor, something that comes from the fermentation itself? Uh, and then the textures uh, of the wine, you know, is it, is it dry? Is it big? Is it round? The shapes. Um, and these are all in the language of how we talk about wine at the winery on a day-to-day -day basis. That said, we're not going to make it nearly as complicated as this. We want to make this kind of fun and simple. So I'm going to advance this um, three or four slides and we'll go through toward, to the end and I'll give you the, the slide that I want you to kind of look at and digest um, while we taste during this, this seminar. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there and, and we'll go through that one together. So is it okay for them to start to keep going through the smell or are they gonna get to the taste yet? So yeah, if, you're, if you've gone through nose by nose, then you can start to taste. And again, you know, taste cross-referencing is also really important here. Um, you know, when you're tasting one wine, how is it different than the next? In, in something like a Pinot, you may get a lot more red cherry. You know, in something more like a Merlot or a Cabernet, maybe you're getting some, some black cherry, some plum, a little bit of that chocolate or oak spice that's a little bit different than the profile, say, of the Pinot Noir, or even of the Zin. The Zin can have that big black pepper, you know, and that can be something that signifies to you that, oh, that's a Zinfandel and that spicy briar uh, component. So I'd say, you know, start tasting through your wines, make notes, 
And we can kind of digest them one at a time uh, if we prefer, or you know, we can take some questions here and there as well. But I think that we'll talk Pinot Noir as you taste, um, and we'll move through to Merlot, Zin, and Cab, and kind of how they correlate. Searle, anything to add there? Well, you know, it's inter interesting. There's different weights of these wines also. Some of these wines are bigger on the palate and, mm -hmm. and the structure of them is there. And I think those can be identifiers too, don't you think? Absolutely. Um, so something like the Pinot, that is going to be the, the lightest of these, you know, uh, typically a little uh, lower weight, but very round in texture, uh, but just not as much of that real big tannic structure that I'd say, you know, on the other end of the spectrum would be the Cabernet Sauvignon, especially, you know, something from Chapelet that's a, you know, real full-blooded hillside expression where you have that tannin, that structure that really kind of fills your mouth and, and gives you some of that tactile tannin on, on the top of your mouth. Merlot and Zinfandel are going to be somewhere in between those two bookends. Um, I'd say Merlot's a little bit heavier than the Zin, but the Zin's tricky because it's all so spicy and alive that, you know, you may see it as maybe thinking it's a little heavier weighted than it actually is because it's just so, you know, it's, it's such a character. Um, you know, and then Merlot has that silky texture. Of all the Bordeaux varieties, I really feel that Merlot is so noble in that texture. It's like this very, you know, mid-body, you know, silky soft uh, texture. You know, interesting enough, I'm starting to look at some of the questions and comments that are coming up here. Hey, Alex, I'm sorry that you didn't read my letter that I put so much effort and energy into, but um, on the first line of the first part after I said how wonderful it is to have you be my virtual blind taster, um, it says, uh, fun educational and blind tasting. Oh, I hope that you're still able to enjoy this even knowing what the wines are and drinking them. That's okay. We're still going to talk through them. You can pretend that you're blindfolded if you like, but the rest of us actually have them in these little bags. So uh, we're with you, my friend. Alex, we're with you, and we're looking forward to uh, continuing this on. Um, what's that? Oh, Alex, you didn't buy the kit. You're coming along for free. Even better. This is great. This is terrific. We like people who poach. This is marvelous. This is all about having fun. What did I say? So as, we, as we're looking at these wines, and you have some characteristics, you have some flavor uh, that you should be able to relate with in front of you visually, but also in the taste. So my hope is that while you're tasting these wines, you're getting an opinion of what wines have what flavors in them. And you're starting to get an, an idea of how you want to rate these wines and which wines you want to put in each category. So one through four, uh, you're starting to get an opinion. Is there chocolateness? doesn't have that cigar box, but because that would be mm -hmm. more in the Cabernet section, right? And that'd be more tied to that. If, um, you know, what's interesting is spiciness. I have a hard time in my palate identifying fig in the Zinfandel. And I'm just telling you personally about myself. I do get the spiciness of the clove. I do get some of the spices of black pepper in there. But the fig is overpowered to me, so I've never been able to get that even, up, even though I've tried. And I think that speaks to everybody's palate being a little different, our noses being a little different, and how we sense things. So it doesn't have to be that every single characteristic fits you. And there are some other flavors that we can talk about that are not visually here. I think this visual thing was really clear and really crisp. And thank you, Blakesley, for putting this together, because I think that you can, you can kind of sense this. And, and as I said, this is not supposed to be really complicated. This is supposed to be fun and interesting. And at the same time, maybe you're starting to think about what food items would you want to have with a particular wine, because that's part of it too. And by the way, Ryan is an amazing chef. He's an amazing huh. So he can talk to you about some of that. So if you have questions about food items, talk to us about that too. I think that's really important, Cyril, because what you said, um, especially, you know, the Zin's a perfect example. We all have an idea of what briar tastes like, you know, what a bramble or a briar or a blackberry is. And, 
you know, then we even, we could even dissect blackberry if we want, you know, is it, is it a ripe blackberry? Is it that semi underripe, semi sweet blackberry, you know, that sort of thing. Um, another thing that I think is really important here, and I'm sitting in front of all these oak barrels for a reason is they have such a big impact on what we're doing here. You know, is there vanilla sweetness? Is there a cedariness? You know, the, the spiciness of clove, um, or some of the, you know, roasted espresso notes uh, or coffee. Um, how do those things add in? And, you know, how are we as winemakers pushing those flavors in different directions, depending upon which wine you're, you're tasting? You know, we use a lot of um, very kind of strong, um, big French oak on something like a Cabernet and, you know, at, at higher percentages. And then on something like a Pinot Noir, you know, they're really about 50% for us, but they're not the same barrels. You know, we want those barrels to articulate, you know, what's great about Pinot, accentuating that red fruit. Uh, you know, the Zinfandel is here at Chapel in, you know, about 30% American barrels. And that adds like that very kind of sweetness, you know, so it's, it's a different profile for each of these wines. And that's kind of a secondary effect of that, of that oak treatment that we have the, uh, the honor of applying to each of these to kind of push those wines in certain directions as well. So also think about how those oak spices can kind of play into your whole um, profile of the wine, both in nose and palate. You know, it's interesting. So many great friends I'm seeing here are joining us, uh, Rye and mm -hmm. uh, Kathy and Tony. Uh, great question. Uh, Rye, Kathy and Tony say there's no possible way that there's a Pinot Noir in here. Um, so Well, uh, that's, there that's, is. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> with you 100% there, but... Um, um, a little bit about our Pinot Noir. Um, we source, uh, this particular Pinot Noir is from the Green Valley of the Russian River. Uh, and it's a site that wants to deliver this amount of extract. Um, and I think that's really important here uh, to remember. In the winemaking at Chaplet, it's our goal to take what the vineyard is doing and express it. So if there's a Pinot Noir that wants to be this kind of bigger full weight, it's our jobs to respect that site and really take it to what it's meant to be. Um, and similarly with the Merlot, Zinfandel and Cabernet is the hardest thing to do is to take a vineyard and steer it away from its natural inclination. So if you have a Pinot that wants to be a little bit, you know, larger and expressive, you know, our job is to run with that and to make it as beautiful as possible. And we do that through different fermentation techniques, you know, using different yeast, using our optical sorter at Chapelet to get the most pristine berries into the tank, and then really coddling these wines through their elevage, through their aging process to make sure that we try to maintain everything that comes out of the vineyard as much as we can until it gets to your glass. Um, and that's, that's the hardest part too, is, you know, having these wines from fermentation through to the final bottle product to get something that resonates with that vineyard. So back to this vineyard though, in, in, in Russian river, it's a very cold site uh, that generates a lot of color uh, that generates that full bodied, a little darker expression. Uh, it's, you know, a mix of different clones. So those different clones, both kind of express themselves differently and, and really build that wine up. Um, and we can talk about it a little bit more, you know, when we reveal these, we'll kind of get into the real nuts and bolts of what these wines are uh, one at a time. Perfect. We are gonna be doing a poll for everybody. So keep this secret, please don't open up the bags yet. Um, and once we reveal, we, we will, as Ryan says, we'll get into a lot more on it. You know. Uh, there's a question that Mark Yeager is asking us, and Ryan, I'm going to put this over to you. Um, he states, Chapelet wines have such great distinctiveness and their flavor sets them apart from many others. Um, he said, is it the terroir, the winemaking, or some kind of secret magic? All of those things. <laughs> <laughs> nice question, Mark. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, it... To, my idea of Tuar is, is not just the vineyard, 
but all the people that are involved at each stage. So terroir is, is almost a larger concept for me personally, uh, that you start with a vineyard that has a, a very unique expression, then you know, it moves into the winery, uh, the winemaker or the wine house, such as Chapelet, has a certain style that we want to try and, and really impress on these wines and a certain quality that we really want to undertake and maintain. And then it goes through to, you, you know, you people as well, uh, really valuing what we value, hopefully, you know, seeing these wines and going, well, gosh, you know, that Chapelet Cabernet really is a great representation of what Hillside is. And hopefully what we've done is taken that terroir of Pritchard Hill um, and, you know, fermented it respectfully and done our job to, to kind of get it in the right direction and then give it to you. And then, that, then we get to give our terroir back. Um, and that's kind of how I look at terroir. I don't look at it just as a site because the site, though it's amazing, you know, uh, good grapes, can make great wine, great, great vineyards can make great wine, but winemakers can also step in and we can do our jobs poorly. And, and then to our just would, would fail. So, right, it sounds like most of these people are getting a pretty good idea of what this is. I'm sorry, Kathy and Tony, but it is tough. There's no way, no, no question about this. This is not meant for wimps. This is meant for people who are interested in having fun with it. Don't get too carried away with it. You don't get graded on it. This is no grades. Now, do I think what we're going to do is we're going to pull put the poll up there. While we put the poll up there, we'd like to have everybody vote. We have four questions in every category. We're going to go wine one. Excuse me. Blakesley, my wife, is going to pair in here. So Blakesley, tell us what, how this works. Um, so you're going to have a poll pop up on your screen. And there are four questions in it, and it's going to ask you to do your best job at identifying what wine number one is, what wine number two is, what wine number three is, and what wine number four is. So we're going to let you all weigh in, put in your votes, and then we're going to share the results with everybody. And Ryan Cyril will reveal the wines and let you know how you all did collectively. So in each category, one two, three, and four, there are four choices. You should choose one of those four choices in each category. And please go ahead and be doing that. We'll give you a few moments to, to deal with that. I know it's technically challenging, but um, for those of you that are like me, um, I couldn't do any of it without having my assistant Erica on one side and my wife on the other side telling me how to do this and what, what it all works on. And um, at this point, I'll talk to a few people. Um, we've got 152 people as part of this. We've got 42 of you who have weighed in. We're looking forward to seeing at least 100 of you weigh in. So we're not, we're not gonna be casual about it. Everybody has to weigh in. You gotta do this in order to make it all work for us. We know, look, it, you paid a lot of money to do this. You're paying a fortune to have Ryan and myself in front of you. And we know that we're the greatest showman on earth, but uh, we're going to leave that to Barnum and Bailey um, because they actually were the greatest showman on earth. But hey, Paige, Pete, Brittany, and Jeff from New Jersey, thanks very much for spending your evening. I know it's a little bit later for you than it is for us. Uh, Beth and your group of nine coming from Lake Martin, oh, cool. Alabama. I don't know you guys personally, but when this whole thing is over, I hope you're going to come visit us. Come see me in the Shea. Yeah, and you got to, and so one of the things that I'd really love everybody to do who was on this, if this is fun and interesting, let us know and st stay in touch with us. Send us back a message. Um, we're going to do a humorous little raffle at the end of this, and we'll figure out something very cool to do with it. Karen, you got six people from Rock Beach, Florida. Uh, Jeff, Westchester County, Leslie and Vince in Miami, Brooke McGinnis and uh, McGinnis in New Hampshire, Glenn and Heather in Vermont, hey, Thomas in Wichita, Kansas. Hey, you know, Ryan, we've got a lot of people. It must be about dinner time for them on the East Coast out there uh, doing it. So I hope you're considering what you're going to eat with these wines because uh, we can probably pull the slide away. I think they've got the slide 
done, Ryan, right, we can get back up in front of him again. There we go. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, Ryan, I know that uh, you got a spit cup in front of you, and I've got a spit cup in front of me. Um, Cheers. I think the big question that, that I'd like to ask people is, you know, what is your favorite? Forget about what the varietal is. Mm -hmm. you, what I'd like you to all do is put a little star by the one that you like the best, and then you can find out what, what that is afterwards, because in the long and short of it, right, isn't that really what it's about? Sure. And I'm sure some of you are going to try and pigeonhole me and ask me which one's my favorite. And I like them all. So, you know, that's an okay answer as well. Uh, you know, if you feel like Merlot today or Cabernet today, you may feel like Pinot tomorrow. And that's really important to me as a winemaker on the days. So I blind taste test with, with Philip uh, for blending every single day. Some way of this is how we blend at Chaplet. So we start out with these you know, big changes and then we needle it down, but everything's done blind. We randomize it, we have our assistant winemaker, Ben, put together the blends and then we go into it blind. So you're getting a little taste of what this is like to see in these kind of very broad differences, what we do on a daily basis. And I just encourage you that, you know, if Pinot Noir is not hitting you tonight, try it again later because when I blend Cabernet and come home, Usually I go to Chardonnay by the time I get home. So each day your taste buds are gonna kind of command you to make different taste choices for yourself. Okay, we have remarkable nine, we hit 100, that's great. Okay, 100 out of 152 people. How do we do? That's, that's significant, isn't it? When we look at polls to see that higher percentage, it'll be a very accurate poll. This is marvelous. You know what's interesting, uh, Right, you described really beautifully a question that uh, Jack just sent in, asking how often do we uh, utilize blind tasting in the winemaking process. You already just described it perfectly. So that was a great question. It's wonderful when you can answer a question before it gets to you because you're so perceptive about what people really want to understand about the winemaking. I mean, it's, look, it's what we do every day, so it's not abnormal for us. So what I think we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and explain first of all um i think what we'll do is we might well unveil the wines and unveil. then we'll do you want to reveal those results first honey okay Blakesley wants to reveal the results first and um so what we're going to do is we're going to start with wine number one and wine number one has 51% who say that that is a Merlot. Okay, I've got a little M on the side of my uh, side of mine there. It says that's 51% Merlot, 51% for Merlot there. Nine number two, interesting enough, 47% of those people say that that's a Zinfandel. Okay, 47%. That, by the way, that's a great majority. I, I'll give you some of the other numbers. 28% said it was Merlot, 12%, no, excuse me, 26, 26% said it was Merlot, and 11% said it was Cabernet Sauvignon, 15% said it was Pinot Noir. So this looks like it definitely is weighed in the Zinfandel characteristics. And on the number three wine, substantially, 61% gave that as a Pinot Noir. So somebody must think there's Pinot Noir there. Interesting. And on the last wine, 69% said that this is Cabernet Sauvignon. You know what? Pretty good. Uh, do I need to even unveil the bags? I guess I better do it, right? Yeah. So wine number one, I'm sure everybody at their homes have done the same thing already, and you're welcome to do that now. But wine number one is the 2017 signature Cabernet, oh, excuse me, 2017 <laughs> That was, sorry, I screwed you all up. You, so you're right, 100% there. See, I didn't even know what they were. Wine number two is, sure enough, 2017 Zinfandel. Wine number three. Man, this is a heavy bottle, right? What'd you put in this thing? Man, okay, I can't get his clothes off. Wait a second, they, 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 they tricked me. Josh tied this thing and taped it, all right? 
is Pinot Noir. So number three is Pinot Noir. And number four, by sheer coincidence, turns out it is Cabernet Sauvignon. And let me get this bottle off here, but that's no other choice besides the 2017. So what's interesting about this is that every one of these wines, except for the Pinot Noir, is a 2017. So there's a lot of similarity of those wines. And I would have to say that we have a remarkable group of tasters here. And either they took some great clues um, and they were able to go by our program, or they're just brilliantly smart individuals um, and they have a great, they get great palates where they understand what they're tasting. And maybe it's a little bit of, of both of that. Brian, what do you think about trying to walk through these wines? Maybe just start with one and just kind of talk about why they were so correct and, and kind of speak to the, to the wine. Yeah, do we want to go in tasting order, Cyril? Um, for clarity? Well, they nailed it. There's no question. They, they nailed it. People, so over half the people said clearly that this was the Merlot. So, so number one, Merlot. Uh, so this Merlot, I just pulled up the stats on this. This is 76 Merlot, 11 Cab Sauvignon, 6% Malbec, 5% Cabernet Franc, and 2% Petit Verdot. And so this is a blended wine. And Merlot really takes well to the blending process at Chapelet. And getting a little bit of that cab, a little some of the other varieties to kind of prop it up and, and flesh it out is part of kind of the, the magic of Bordeaux blending. Uh, and then this Merlot, you know, particularly, I really think this has a lot of black cherry, you know, plum, anise, those, those characters that we were looking at. Uh, and then, you know, lots of that kind of red currant. So to those of you that got it, well done. Well, that's certainly over half of the group. Now, if you were going to taste these in an order because of structure or anything else, how would you tend to taste these? Would Great you, question. Starting with a particular wine, and, and what, what would you So, so it, in a more kind of perfect world, if I was presenting these non-blind, I would start with the Pinot Noir. I then proceed to the Zinfandel, then to the Merlot, and then to the Cabernet Sauvignon. And that's because you're kind of building yourself up the weight scale. You know, if you start with the Cabernet and then try and go back to the Pinot, you're just not quite as sensitive to that lighter wine. And so it's better to kind of start, you know, at the little lower weight wine and build yourself up. Um, and so Pinot, you know, being lighter, it just doesn't saturate your palate as much, doesn't impede your ability to keep tasting. And Zinfandel similarly, and then it's really nice to taste those two Bordeaux wines side by side because you start to really needle out the differences between Merlot and Cabernet Sauvignon because they, they do share in, in some of their, their tastes, their profiles, their lineage. And then also the blending kind of, you know, makes them a little bit even harder to, to kind of parse perfectly. So kind of get the, get the Pinots in and then go to the Merlot and Cab. So if you were to choose which wine you'd prefer tasting next, which one you, would you go to, do you think? I would talk about the Pinot. Okay, let's go to that. So uh, this Pinot, this is uh, the Bateman Pinot, um, 2018 Bateman. As I said, Bateman is a really cold site out in the Green Valley of the Russian River. Uh, it's about, you know, I think it's six, seven, maybe eight miles from the Pacific Ocean. So it's a very cold site. This is always the last Pinot to come in. It's a blend of clone 777 and 115. Uh, and Lee Fay and uh, her husband Paul own this, but the Duttons farm it. And it's just such a bucolic vineyard. You go there, he's got Asian pears planted everywhere. He's got a big bamboo forest. It's just a beautiful place. And it really makes that big full-blooded Pinot Noir. And so I would start there and we can kind of go through one by one if you want to go straight off to the Zin from there, Cyril. So, you know, the spices of the Zin, I think is a real telltale sign. Yes. This wine really shows this. And I think one of the things that's interesting is both the Zinfandel and the Pinot Noir are from great friends and people who have become great friends or people who were great friends before. And in the case of Bald Mountain, it's one of Philip's best fish, fishing buddies and best friends. And when that vineyard came about because he got hired away by his family to do a much bigger task and couldn't 
physically make wine anymore because, uh, you know, the challenge was what was going to happen with that. And Philip jumped all over it. And you and Philip have been making this incredible wine. You want to talk a little about Bald Mountain and, and uh, particularly the Zinfandel? Yeah. Uh, Bald Mountain, as Cyril already said, is another special place. And I think that's the main mission. When we, you know, have to leave Pritchard Hill to find things, to concentrate on things away from Pritchard Hill, we really try to find places that are special and kind of remind us of Don's vision uh, of the winemaking of Pritchard Hill. So if you arrive at Ball Mountain, it's about 2,000 feet elevation. It's at the top of Wall Road, Oakville Grade, kind of going over the, the mountains into Sonoma, but it's still on the Napa side. And it's dry farmed, which is amazing. And it's a, about a 50 year old vineyard at this point. These vine, you know, Zinfandel vines love to age. They keep giving you quality as they age. Uh, it's all old school, head trained. It's a beautiful heritage vineyard. And so we really get this Zin to protect it. You know, we believe that people should be drinking this wine and seeing it. And Zinfandel is becoming rarer and rarer in the Napa Valley. And so to be able to working work with uh, the Thatcher family to, to use this stuff is really, really fun. Zins also, uh, we could talk about cluster morphology just for a little bit. Cluster morphology is just a fancy way of saying what do grapes look like. Uh, Zinfandel grapes are these very large clusters, big berries, Pinot Noir is quite small, uh, and then Merlot and Cabernet, if I just held them up to you, you wouldn't even know the difference. You could go, ah, maybe that's a Merlot, maybe that's a Cabernet but we really have to go on, on what the leaves look like and, and that sort of thing. So it's a whole nother, that's a whole nother lecture. That's a whole nother Zoom. And that's something, you know, maybe we'll, we'll pry uh, Dave out of the vineyard to educate people on vines via Zoom at some point, but we'll, who knows, we'll see. Well, we have a lot of opportunities going forward. It's, what I'd really love to do is have some of our guests send us messages or email us and let us know what would they like to see us do some of these on? Because, you know, we run out of ideas and plans for, uh, for what, they, what they are and, and what things we, we might be able to do. So if we can uh, get some insight from any of you, we're happy to, to take advantage of that, you know. So, by the way, there was somebody that said, uh, the, is the Merlot number one? Yep, the Merlot was number one, and it should be number one. Uh, and I'm glad to see that it was. Another question is, all these bottles are very different shape. Why are they different shapes? And why is it that, we, that you choose, right, to put the Cabernet and the Merlot in a bottle that's very similar, but you put the Zinfandel and the uh, Pinot Noir in extremely different bottles? So can you talk a little bit? I mean, they don't, you can't see all the difference, but you can certainly see the difference of the Pinot Noir. Well, the, the Pinot Noir is in a burgundy bottle. That's the traditional shape of you know, Burgundy, France, which is the you know, providence of Pinot Noir. Uh, for us, you know, so much of what we do has already been kind of schemed by France and perfected for many hundreds of years and we're borrowing, you know, from their knowledge and that's what the, the wine industry in California really borrowed from to start up. So we took kind of the, the French workings of, of varieties, what to plant, and then kind of how to do it. And, but we have a lot more flexibility on what we can do in the vineyard. Uh, we have no rule structures that tell us what to do, uh, you know, blend this, blend that, how to ferment. So then you get this wonderful creativity of the West Coast and people like Don Chaplet saying, you know, I'm going to go plant Cabernet on a hill east of St. Helena in this bouldery place where, you, you know, if, if you were a person planting the valley in the early 60s, planting hillside fruit just sounded like a, a bizarre idea. Um, but it's a wonderful place to grow Cabernet. So really those bottle shapes are, are of, of the French lineage and we, we kind of respect that. Thank you. I think that it, it is interesting because there's a reason why, why we do that. The other part of the challenge is, is you notice that I'm in my wine cellar. Some of the bottles stack much easier <laughs> in the wine cellar than others. And it happens to be these burgundy bottles when there's an earthquake, they're the ones that slide out and come onto the floor and make a mess. Whereas the Cabernet grip bottles and the ones that we use more of a Bordeaux style tend to be a little bit higher shoulder. They tend to naturally hold themselves back into the shelf easier. Um, so 
Yeah, you know, it's kind of interesting. We use all these different si style of bottles and um, we did have somebody, hey David, thank you very much. You're right on it and uh, I really appreciate you. you you're jumping the line by uh, not sending me an email, but sending it right here to say, would you be, re be willing to do a white wine seminar on what's this wine? That was um, my idea too. I wanted to do that as well. <laughs> okay, right, you're up. So We're back on. We will do that. And David, since you asked for it and Rye said he'd like to do it, uh, we would definitely follow up with that and put together a, a white wine. What's your white wine? And, and what are the white wines, Rye, that you happen to make? Do we think we, do we make four of them or something? Can we make that many to be interesting for people? We could do four. Uh, two are going to be pretty complicated, but you know, this is a pretty savvy group, so maybe we can do that. Uh, yeah, we do, we do make um, multiple different whites at Chapelet. The one that we're most known for, obviously, at, at first blush is, is Molly Chenin Blanc, which is planted on Trichard Hill. It's three acres of Chenin Blanc uh, that the family has been making since they acquired the property. Uh, and then we also make for our grower collection uh, line of wines, uh, a little bit of Viognier. And then we also make, I think we could probably do two Chardonnays that are quite different because Chardonnay is such a wide field that we can really kind of see like what one style versus another, one place versus another. So yeah, we could pull apart a, a white wine blind tasting and, and that would be fun. Okay, I think we've been challenged to do it. So I think, I don't think we have any choice now. I think we got to do that one. So, so uh, I, I think that's going to be in the works. We'll figure that out. We'll let, by the way, anybody who signed up for this tasting will get the first shot to be able to be in the next tasting of the vertical. And I think that's really important because we want to support the people who are supporting us. So we will send you out uh, as the premier group, um, the op option of doing that. Um, we also had uh, Fred who said, how about a vertical tasting? Would you guys consider doing a vertical tasting? He said it would be a lot of fun. It might be a little more expensive, but <laughs> he said he's up for it. So um, my hope is that he has some friends and some of his friends would be up for it too. But in a couple of weeks, we are going to be doing a vertical. So, so be watching that. It's on uh, May 28th. And so that will be fun. And we'll try to give you plenty of time to be able to get these wines in your cellar, or you might already have them. So, so I think before we move on, um, just to come back to the wines, uh, we need to talk about your dad's wine uh, or your wine, Cyril, the signature Cabernet Sauvignon. Would you like to give us a history lesson on that, Cyril? Little history lesson. I don't know if everybody can see the bottle, and you, you probably all have one at home. But you'll notice that the logo is in gold. Well, that is in gold because this is our 50th anniversary, the 2017th vintage. So we did that on all of the 2017 wines that the Chapelet made. This wine was a wine, the Singer Cabernet, that was conceived and put together in 2000, excuse me, 1980, right? Yeah, 1980. And that was the first vintage of it. And that time, Dad signed the bottle right, well, on this bottle. I guess I should use the same bottle. Instead of signing it up above, right below the chapel, he signed it right at the bottom there. And, and the idea was that it was a wine that in those years was remarkably big, intense. My dad thought it'd be a wine that would age really well. He liked the idea of when a wine was going to be remarkable and wine was going to last for a long time, charging a higher price for it. So we had to convince dad that he had to do something special. And one of the things that I'm noticing right here is the tremendous legs on this wine over the rest of the wines. And in a moment, when I finish the talk about it, I'd like Ryan to maybe just speak to that a little bit of why that is and why that's doing that to the glass. But this was a wine that, uh, that was really important, kind of in a new direction. We were starting to plant some more vineyards. We were starting to replant some of the older vineyards. And as we move forward, the 1981, 82, and 83 did not get to be signature Cabernets. And they went back to the previous price. It was a few dollars more for the signature Cabernet. And then in 1984, we were able to make a a 
Cabernet that went down to my father's signature all the way through. Um, only one vintage, which Philip reminded me last time we talked about this, was 1988. And the wine just wasn't up to the characteristic. And I think that Philip spoke recently about something that my dad started, and I hope that I'm carrying on in a good way, which was if there's ever a question between quantity and quality, the quality wins out. And there's no question, and Philip stated it a little more directly, is saying that even if we needed another 500 cases of a particular wine because we had a market for it or something, I've never pushed him to do it, nor did my father ever push him to go ahead and bite the bullet and make a wine that would be a lesser wine and make more of it uh, in order to make a number. And that the important part is that the winemaking team has to be completely religious at every point. If they decide a barrel shouldn't go into it, if they decide something should, doesn't work in this, that they can pull that down to be the best of the best. And at that time, that's what was happening with this wine. This wine has become our absolutely most important wine that Chapelet makes. There's no question about it. Year in and year out, it is the wine that is at restaurants all over the country. And the one thing that I'm really proud of is dad was always really fair with his pricing. We've continued to be fair with our pricing. And this wine over delivers at a level that almost no other wine in the Napa Valley does. This wine is uh, a beautiful expression of what you can do with a, from great vineyards and a great winemaking team, good barrels, good program all the way around, and their ability to make the wine that they can put together. So Ryan, if you want to add anything more to that, that's great. Uh, just to get into the nuts and bolts, the, uh, the blend on this cab is 82% Cabernet Sauvignon, 10% Petit Bordeaux, and 8% Malbec. And just to echo what Searle said is the Chapley family is incredibly supportive of the winemaking team. Uh, they let us be as hawkish for quality as we can be. You know, if we have to kick out a barrel, if it's two barrels, four barrels, whatever we think through our extensive, extensive blending. And you can talk to Philip about that sometime. It's every day um, that we blend, almost 365. We even blended in the middle of harvest last year, which is crazy. But they allow us to do that. Uh, Searle also allows us to buy hordes of new barrels every year so that we can get these wines into the oak that they need. And really it starts in the vineyard with that you know, hillside expression. It starts in the Chapelet's own very backyard of Pritchard Hill. And it's a place that grows Cabernet, Petit Bordeaux, and Malbec very, very well. And so those legs that we were talking about, these wines have tons of color. They're super saturated with color. They're super dark. And then what that does is that tannin and the color kind of link up. And the, that's what makes these wines so ageable. You know, I encourage you, if you liked something like the Signature, you know, take a bottle, stuff it in your wine fridge, look at it in 10 years. If you can have the ability to store it right, you know, look at it in 20 years. You know, the wines of Chapelet age, and it's because of the provenance of the vineyard. And so we, we harness that through winemaking techniques, but it's really, it comes from the vineyard and we just grab it and try and run with it and, and make something for you to enjoy. You know, Ryan, you've talked about dad and you knew dad well and you spent a lot of time with my dad. He adored you and Philip and the whole team and it's, it's important. This was his passion. There's no question about it. Yeah. I'm really fortunate because all of my brothers and sisters are completely passionate about it. My sister, Leisha, my oldest sister, is with my mother right now watching this and it's great to see that Leisha's out there helping mom through uh, this, this test. Uh, I, I think mom got 100%, and if she did, I'd lie anyway. Uh, that's what you do when you're, you're the number one son, so to speak. But I also have my brother, Dominic, who's got his uh, three or four of his kids uh, all there, and uh, I haven't seen his scores to see if all of his kids got 100%, but I certainly hope that they did because they're the next generation. They're the ones who are gonna make this happen in the future. And I think that's what we're all doing. We're building this for the next generation to really make this work. And, I, and uh, you know, it's without being kind of weird about it, I've got to tell you that we give our all every day. And our, my family does, and, and this, is, this is our passion. We are 
tremendously hampered right now by the current situation as every business person is because we can't get out and see people around the country. As Philip said yesterday when I was talking to him, he said, God, this has really got to hurt you a lot because you're pretty social. You're out there with people all the time. How can you survive this long without being on the road? Because over the years, Philip and Ronnie and their teams have seen me gone more than I'm here because I end up being on the road trying to see our guests and our clients all over the country. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting challenge, but, but I gotta say that without all of you who are drinking these wines and tasting these wines, you're our most important Pied Pipers. You're the ones who tell your friends. And I'd love to have you give some responses back to us and give us some ideas and some critiques about what we're doing. We know that you already enjoy the wines to some level, otherwise you wouldn't even done this. My hope is that what we've done here is entertained everybody a little bit, giving you some information um, and giving you some insight. Um, Blakesy, can you hand me that hat over there? So how many people have one of these? <laughs> I know that Catherine Schumann has one because it is now gray. Everything is gray all over here because she's been wearing it for like the last seven or eight years and she wears it every place that she is. I finally was so embarrassed by how abused her hat was that I had to send her a new one. I'd like to send some people here a hat. And so I'd like to, talk, to say to send the top 10 people who have made comments and sent us notes and messages. I'm gonna send you all a hat. So all of you who have gotten viscerally involved with it, typed in your messages, um, I will be sending the top 10 people who have continued to ask questions. You know what's interesting? I just saw another 25 questions come up. Unbelievable, <laughs> right? These guys know how to game the system, right? All right, I'll do the top 20, okay? The top 20 people will get a hat, and I couldn't be more thrilled. But it's kind of fun when you guys become our Pied Pipers, and you're the people who are driving our brand and helping us to get where we need to. Well, I can't put it there because of the way of everything. But, um, you know, I'm not joking. You don't understand how important you are to the long-term benefit of our business. And that is you, and the reason why this was set up is because we had a couple long-term club members whose children were home from college. And they said, what are we going to do? Why don't you do a tasting for us? We said, well, we can't do a tasting for you. And Blake said, oh, yes, we can. We can do one of those virtual things. That'll be great. And we asked Ryan if he'd do it. And uh, he jumped right out of his own personal garden, his flower beds and everything else to, to do this with us. And, um, you know, I hope that you're having as much fun as Ryan and I have had doing this. Um, and, and, and honestly, this has been a lot of fun. Are there any other questions that, need to, that I need to address? or that Ryan needs to address before, because I know we've taken way too much of your dinner time. Um, <laughs> Glenn asked a question, could smell the first three, but not the cab. Hmm. Interesting. Why would that be, Ryan? Why do you think they could smell? I mean, the cab is one of the biggest wines in the group, mm -hmm. but all of them kind of have a unique smell. Um, Oh, if somebody wants to have one of our white hats with a red logo on it. Yeah, the old school. Yeah. Right. I'll try to find one of those for you. So not so it's not just your dad who has it. I'll try to find one of those. I'm there sure. Also, there was a question about the brand, uh, the logo. Uh, the logo is a picture of our winery from from the helicopter bird's eye view. Uh, so if you look down on the winery, it's a pyramid structure, and it makes that pattern. Um, so that's, that's where the logo comes from. So if you go on to Google, you know, find us, 1581 Sage Canyon Road, St. Helena, California, and you can take a look at that pyramid. And that's the logo of Chapelet. We're going to be doing some fun things this next year. One of the things that I probably shouldn't let out of the bag, but, you know, I can't, I can't stop my marketing arm from speaking a little bit. Uh, we're going to give... Uh, some of our really, really long-term wine buyers, the option of being able to be on a big boulder and we are going to carve their name into a big boulder that overlooks 
a particular part of the vineyard. Um, and, and when you said about getting a bird's eye view or getting an aerial view or a Google view, which um, all of the people here know what that is now, um, it reminded me of, of, of kind of Google and Google Earth is almost like spying on people. And you kind of look at everything in their backyard. So don't go up to my place because there might be a few trucks and cars out there. And Blakesy says it looks like uh, North County or something. But uh, but we uh, you get a good view of our vineyards. You get an idea of the diversity of our vineyards by looking at something like Google Earth. So take full advantage of those. Um, um, there's are, are there any country music fans out there? I'll give you a thumbs up from us. But on May 22nd, Carly Pierce, Michael Ray are gonna be doing a concert. We're gonna be doing it virtually. They're gonna be doing it from their home. We're gonna be supplying some wine to all of you that like to do it. We're gonna work back and forth to a similar structure as we're doing. But instead of seeing Rye there, you're gonna see uh, Michael Ray uh, and Carly Pierce uh, there playing, uh, playing music from their living room and helping with that. Cool. These things have to be entertaining, as I said, for us too. And I think that we've seen that to be the case tonight. Um, and and we, we, we will keep doing these for you if you're interested in it. I think we've been able to play with about 150 to 160 people on and off uh, during the day. We've never got less than 150 uh, today. Uh, I think that's terrific. I think that that's uh, remarkable. And anything that we can follow up with, don't hesitate to reach out to us, okay? Um, so. What I really need to do is I need to grab two of my geniuses right here. And John Charles never does this. He has them on the back side of the screen. But Erica, I need you to come over here to my right, right here. And Blake, I need you to come over to my left, right over here. You can, you've all got to come in. You, got, you all got to do distance, but I live with them every day. So, so, um, so this is Blakesley and my most important person every day in my office is Erica. And Erica makes it all happen, and she's been running some of the, the, the technical parts of it today and helping us out. So as we said, this is a team sport, and Ryan and I are so fortunate to have so much support at every level. Uh, Ryan, you wanted to give them a couple of closing comments about this and maybe give them a big toast uh, for being able to bear with us and, and hang with us for the day? Yeah, uh, I'd say, you know, if you have any other geeky questions, bring them on, you know, send them here at the winery, find me out, visit our website, and then, you know, keep, hopefully you enjoyed all of the wines um, and our efforts. Uh, you know, we get to ferment these only once a year. And so we really try and focus on, on bringing the very best out. So hopefully you're well and with family and cheers. Cheers. Rye, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate it. Anybody who wants to get to Rye Richards at the winery, it's just ry at chapelet.com. Really easy. ry at chapelet.com. Um, the nice thing about it, he's thoughtful. He'll give you a good answer. And uh, if you give your telephone number, he'll call you and he'll give you a phone answer to it. I'm much better by phone. If you want to call me anytime, give me a call. You can find me on our website. I'd be happy to uh, handle anything any way that I can. But, Cheers to all of you. I think we've taken well over our allotted hour. I don't know how much time we're in, but I'm not good at keeping time anyway. Um, as Erica says, if she didn't have a leash on me, she wouldn't be able to get me to things. So, um, so cheers to everybody. Have a wonderful evening. I hope you've all decided on what you're going to enjoy for dinner with this wine. And I hope that somebody has been going out to the grill to grill it because I think these things scream of a great steak or maybe some lamb, but something really satiating to have with it. Ryan, what are you gonna have for dinner with this? I don't know, but I'm getting hungry. Well, Ryan, <laughs> you're always hungry. We get it. Cheers. Cheers. Everybody.